Welcome back. Recent years have seen a rise in extremist groups in Africa. Apart from Boko Haram in Nigeria, there's Al-Shabaab in Somalia and an Al-Qaeda offshoot organization known as Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. What has made Africa a hotbed for Islamic extremism and are these groups working together for a common goal? To answer those questions and many more, I'm joined by Zainab Chaudhry, the chair of the Maryland Outreach Office for the Council on American Islamic Relations. Zainab, thanks for joining us. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. These three groups, main groups in Africa, do they have anything in common or do they have a common purpose? From all accounts and purposes, what it appears is that they leverage Islam to really advance their, their directives, their agendas, and their goals. Um, and it, it's really concerning because it, clearly the, the actions that they engage in are not reflective of, of the teachings of Islam. Uh, just for example, the group Boko Haram, who recently has been in the news a lot for the kidnappings of the Nigerian schoolgirls, uh, this group, the leader of this group claims that uh, he follows the teachings of Islam and he's commanded by God to, to kidnap these girls and sell them for marriage. Uh, when in actuality, if he were to open the Quran and actually read verses from the Quran, it clearly states that this kind of activity is clearly forbidden. Uh, women have the right to choose who they marry. They have the right to say yes or no. Um, and education also is, is, is very, very much encouraged in Islam. And so for these kind of groups to discourage these kind of, kind of activities, it's really concerning. Right. As you say, the religion has been hijacked. Islam has been hijacked by these groups, and they are resorting to violence uh, to uh, move ahead with whatever purpose they have. I mean, but one thing that is common, it seems, to all three groups is that there are certain conditions in the countries where they operate that have created a very fertile breeding ground for their creation. Absolutely, and, and that's a great point that you raised because unfortunately there are conditions locally within each individual country that help cultivate this atmosphere in which these groups are, are able to recruit, recruit people, people to come join their ranks. Um, and a large part of it, I think, comes back to the government and the responsibility and the role that the government plays in making sure that its citizens are protected, its constituents are protected, and they have access to adequate resources to really make sure that their citizens aren't uh, suffering from poverty or conditions that, that would facilitate groups like these to, to recruit the individuals to their ranks. Right, and the other thing we often experience about groups like this, extremist groups, is that they always have the loudest voice, you know, especially when they commit spectacular things like kidnapping, you know, hundreds of schoolgirls or yeah. carrying out bombing raids and stuff like this. And there's a tendency, there's a response in the, in the West, in the United States particularly, then to tar everyone with the same brush. It's Islam, they do horrible things, that's what they do. And, and that's really unfortunate. I, it, it, we see that happen all too often. And, and it's unfortunate that, for example, the, the Christian counterpart to, to this group, Boko Haram, which is the Lord's Resistance Army, which is based in Uganda, um, it, it also is in, engaged in gross human rights violations. And yet we don't see the international community, the, community, the global community, uh, create an uproar about their teachings of Christianity. Um, and yet when groups like Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, they engage in these kind of activities, the American Muslim community specifically, but globally the Muslim community, finds itself on the defensive trying to really correct the narrative and, and show Islam in a positive light and show that Islam does not condone these kind of teachings. Uh, really what we should be focusing on is how we can protect these citizens, how we can make sure that these kind of groups don't have access to, to the kind of resources that it would need to recruit and wage terror and, and engage in these kind of human rights violations. Not questioning whether Islam actually condones these actions. Right. To what extent can we blame growth of groups like Boko Haram, like Al-Shabaab, uh, to what has been growing Islamophobia in the West, especially in the United States? It's almost acted like a recruitment tool for these groups. Absolutely. We, we can't discount that factor. I mean, especially considering the fact that our country does have foreign policies, controversial foreign, foreign policies that affect Muslims globally. Um, and the fact that these kind of groups, they leverage these policies to really, uh, really hijack the narrative and, and, and advance their own goals and their own missions um, just to broaden their own political agendas. Uh, it's really concerning. It is something that is worth revisiting here locally at home to see what kind of, what kind of changes we can make to these policies that can effect a positive change and discourage individuals from, from joining the ranks of these kind of terrorist organizations. Do you think we should see more condemnation of the actions that Boko Haram take or Al-Shabaab take um, 
from Muslim countries, particularly Saudi Arabia. I mean, in this instance, the kidnapping of the schoolgirls, uh, a Saudi Arabian uh, Muslim religious leader described Boko Haram as misguided, and I'm quoting here, set up to smear the image of Islam. Should we be hearing more of this from Muslim countries? I, I think that it's not a case of whether Muslims globally condemn these kind of attacks. I think it's more of whether they're given the microphone, whether their voices are elevated. Um, especially because of the kind of work that we do, we, we hear condemnations from all over the world globally whenever any kind of terrorist activity occur occurs where Muslims are involved. Uh, unfortunately, it's a matter of whether this hits mainstream media and whether this is something that really takes off. So it's, it's really really a, a matter of giving, giving those voices a microphone and amping, amping up those voices. Um, I, I strongly believe that the strongest, the best way to, to really uh, to minimize the effect of the extremist minority is to to advance or to increase increase the impact of the moderate majority and, and that's where there are so many different factors that come into play that can really have an impact well again it comes to the point that the moderate majority is not going to be heard because the extremists and whether it be religion or politics, always have the loudest voice. Absolutely, and unfortunately, another issue that we have to take into account here in the West, especially, is that there is a vast multi-million dollar Islamophobia industry, and this industry is, is uh, in, intent on demonizing Islam and vilifying Muslims. And so unfortunately, whenever we hear of these kind of incidents that happen, whether it's abroad or whether it's locally here at home, uh, the first instinct is for everybody to say, oh, well, this is something that Islam condones because Islam has been so demonized here in the West especially. So it, it's really incumbent upon everybody to really make themselves aware of, of what the true teachings are, are of Islam before, before they attack the religion or those who, follow, who truly follow it. So you work for an organization that is working to change that perception of the religion. Uh, Correct. Are you losing the battle? I would not say so, actually. Um, I, I think it, sometimes it, it's quite a struggle, especially the kind of challenges that we face on a daily basis. Uh, we are a grassroots organization, and we, we do hear all kinds of criticism on a daily basis, but we hear a lot of positive feedback as well. Um, so I wouldn't say that we're fighting a losing battle. Um, I think these kind of incidents actually energize the Muslim community to work even harder to make sure that we're correcting the narrative and we're making sure that we are, the, the, the picture that has been painted of Islam as being this evil religion and Muslims being these demonic people who are here to take over the world is actually not, not the case. Let's get back to these three groups operating in Africa. Do we know uh, to any extent where their support comes from, whether it be financial support or would that be equipment uh, or recruitment? Sure. That's a good question. Unfortunately, I, I'm not, I can't comment on that myself. Um, I'm sure that they have resources locally and, and globally. I'm sure that, that you know, there are different individuals and groups who have a vested interest in making sure that these kind of organizations thrive, these kind of terrorist organizations thrive, and that's something that you know, it bears closer inspection and, and analyzing. You know, you mentioned this earlier, and that is in the, the need for education about the religion and what it stands for. Uh, the perception right now, say, of a group like Boko Haram, is that, you know, Boko Haram says we are acting within the tenets of Islam, which says that girls shouldn't have education, that we should not follow any uh, Western practices whatsoever. That's... Uh, I, that's, I'm glad you raised that point. It's very important to differentiate between culture and religion. And I think that a lot of times the line between culture and religion is blurred. Um, unfortunately, especially in parts of the, of the world where, um, where there, there, it, it, there is a right breeding ground for these kind of organizations, that, that line becomes even more blurred. And it's really important to understand the tenets of the faith versus the cultural mores and the values and the norms of, of, the, of the group of individuals who are engaging in these kind of activities. Uh, Islam, Islam clearly mandates that education is incumbent upon all individuals, regardless of whether they're women or, or, or whether it's a male or a female. Um, the fact that these groups are, are saying that women should not go to school, that women should not become educated, they clearly either are not familiar with Islam or they have not read the Quran or they're just not familiar with, or they just choose to ignore, ignore that part of Islam to advance their own, their own agendas. So what is an organization like yours doing to counter that? 
We are doing outreach. We engage in different diverse faith communities. We make sure that we have a platform where we can elevate the voice of the moderate majority and really educate people on, on what the true tenets of Islam are. Islam is a peaceful religion that encourages folks to be law-abiding citizens of the country in which they reside. Islam encourages people to be good to their neighbors. I mean, there is a verse in the Quran that clearly states that we were created in tribes to get to know one another, to learn to coexist peacefully. And so part of our work also entails working with the, the broader interfaith community to making sure that we are forming alliances and we're building bridges and, and encouraging mutual understanding. What do you make of the First Lady's uh, personal involvement in, in this particular case, the kidnapping of the schoolgirls? I mean, she, uh, that hashtag, you know, bring our girls back, she, there's a photograph of her that's been widely circulated of her holding up this signboard, this notice that's saying, you know, with the hashtag on it. I, I think I think it's it's great that that the first lady is also getting involved in this campaign to to really raise awareness and, and to encourage Boko Haram and and extremist organizations like that to not engage in this kind of activity and to to bring the girls home and I think that's what all of us really want we just want these girls to safely be returned to their families um, it, it's it's good to see that there is involvement on the, on the national level. Um, that politicians are also and, and their spouses are also getting involved. All right, would you like to see more of that perhaps in other forums uh, and under other circumstances? I, I think whenever an, a situation like this occurs, uh, the, the more people who raise their voices and, and really highlight the fact that you know, this is a situ the, an issue that needs to be addressed and um, places pressure on, on the government of the country in which this incident occurred, um, I, I think the better it is. It's, it's really abominable, the fact that it took three weeks for the government of Nigeria to even, you know, bow to, to international pressure to really engage in, in some kind of activity that would help bring these girls home or really take this matter seriously. Uh, a government has to be able to protect its people in order for people to feel like they, that they're safe and they're, they're, they're well respected in their environment. So hopefully it'll help towards that. Okay, Zenab Chowdhury, I've got to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me.